Good afternoon or morning or evening, depending on what time zone you're in. My name is Jim Turk and I'm the director of the Center for Free Expression at Ryerson University in Toronto. I want to welcome you to the first panel in the Center for Free Expression's new weekly virtual forum series. Appropriately enough, the title of today's panel is Pandemics and Civil Liberties. This is not only the first in our new series, but the first panel we've done using Zoom. Before I introduce the panel, I need to mention a few things about the format. You should be able to see the panelists once they are introduced. I will begin a conversation with them. And then after about 45 minutes or so, we'll turn to the audience for any questions you might like to ask. To ask a question, you will need to click on the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Do not use the chat function as it's disabled. Use the question and answer button. You can type in your question at any time during the discussion. The question will go to the center's coordinator, Ange Holmes, um, and your question will not be visible to other attendees. It'll only be visible to you and to Ange. And when you get uh, to when we get to the question and answer part of the discussion, I will ask Ange to read questions one at a time uh, to the panel for discussion. The whole event is being recorded and the video recording will be available on the podcast page of the Center for Free Expression's website. And our website address is cfe.ryerson.ca, cfe.ryerson.ca. Uh, the podcast will also be accessible through the website's events page. I want to thank Ange for all the work she's done to make this series possible. Without her remarkable skills and diligence, it could not have happened. I also want to thank Brian Bowes and Luke Nader from Ryerson University's Media Services, whose technical expertise has been and continues to be invaluable. We thought it appropriate to begin our series by looking at civil liberties in the midst of this pandemic. As governments attempt to deal with the pandemic, they face apparent trade offs between collective well being and individual human rights and civil liberties, whether it be privacy rights or restrictions on our movements and our ability to assemble, or the extent and nature of surveillance that can be authorized with or without our consent, the rights of those in congregated living arrangements, such as prisons, long-term care homes, and shelters, the rights of those who are marginalized because of age or race or economic circumstance, ethnicity, or other legally protected grounds, and the whole host of our other economic, cultural, social, and political rights. We have a remarkable group of panelists today to discuss these issues, and I'd like to introduce each of them now. The first is uh, Renu Menhane, who's the Chief Commissioner of the Ontario Human Rights Commission. As Chief Commissioner, Renu has led groundbreaking investigations into prisons, police services, school boards, and child welfare agencies. Renu has appeared before the Supreme Court of Canada, the United Nations, and numerous parliamentary and legislative standing committees. She has won multiple awards for her work to advance human rights and has been recognized by Canadian Lawyer Magazine as one of Canada's most influential lawyers for her advocacy related to solitary confinement. Renu is the former executive director of the International Human Rights Program at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. She has an LLM in international human rights law from New York University and began her practice focused on criminal law and equality rights. The second panelist I'd like to introduce is Brenda McPhail. Brenda is the Director of Privacy, Technology and Surveillance Project for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Her work fo focuses on litigation, advocacy and public education relating to the ways in which privacy rights are at risk in contemporary society. Current areas of her focus include national security, intelligence and law enforcement surveillance uh, technologies, information sharing in the public and private sector, and the social impacts of existing and emerging technologies, such as smart city technologies, the internet of things, big data, and artificial intelligence. Brenda received her PhD from the University of Toronto's Faculty of Information. Our third panelist is Tim McSorley. Tim is the national coordinator of the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group. Combining his passion for civil liberties and social justice with his background in journalism, policy analysis, and communications, Tim focuses on the impact of government policies and works with allies and partners to fight for change. 
Previously, Tim was the coordinator for the Media Co-op Independent Media Network and the Dominion Magazine. He also served as coordinator for the Voices Wa Coalition, defending the right of dissent and protecting democratic rights in Canada. Tim is a graduate of Concordia University in Montreal with a degree in journalism and in political science. Our fourth panelist is Stephanie Perrin. Stephanie is founder and president of Digital Discretion, which produces reports on matters ranging from identity theft to RFID, conducting risk assessments and training sessions and developing privacy impact assessments and audits. Stephanie has a remarkable career dealing with information and privacy issues. She was one of the first federal access to information and privacy coordinators in Canada. She was the first president of the Canadian Access and Privacy Association. She collaborated with Heather Black on the Personal Information Protection and Electronics Documents Act, PEPIDA, to incorporate this code in federal law for the private sector. Stephanie represented Canada at the OECD on the committee dealing with privacy and security issues. She also has served as Director of Policy and Research at the Office of the Privacy Commissioner and is Director of Risk Management Policy in Service Canada. Stephanie graduated from Carleton University with an MA in English Literature and is now, in addition to everything else she's doing, pursuing a PhD at the University of Toronto Faculty of Information, um, where she is researching issues related to privacy enhanced identity. Welcome panelists. Given the range of experience and knowledge of our panel, our format is for them to have a conversation with each other and then with you. Uh, to, kick, tick, I'm sorry, to kick off this conversation, I would like to ask each of them an initial question, which they will answer fairly briefly in turn to set the stage for the conversation. I'd like to start with Brenda. Uh, Brenda, could you share with us what you see as some of the important ways in which the Canadian response to the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting our civil liberties and human rights? Thanks, Jim. Um, and thanks so much for having me here on this amazing panel. These are some of my favorite people in the world. So I'm so looking <laughs> Mine forward too. to the conversation. <laughs> um, so we are living in an extraordinary time right now. Um, and we have emergency measures acts or public health emergency acts or in some provinces and territories both declared in every jurisdiction across Canada. Um, and what that means is that governments can enact provisions that essentially have the potential of violating or infringing upon virtually every right that we normally enjoy. Um, under our charter with a few exceptions um, and most of our civil liberties. So the impact is unprecedented, frankly. Um, the caveat to that is that some of those infringements are demonstrably necessary in dealing with this current public health emergency um, and do pass a proportionality analysis. Um, the caveat there of course is that particularly as things drag on, it's important for us to stay critical and make sure that that continues to be the case uh, as we move forward. So some of the rights that are impacted, you actually mentioned in your introduction, but I'm going to do some, go through some of those again. Mobility, not just um, our ability to move through public spaces in our cities and, ta and towns, um, and I'm sure anyone who lives in Toronto shares with me the sorrow of not being able to go see the cherry blossoms in High Park. Uh, for Mother's Day weekend, uh, but also from province to province, where provinces are, to my knowledge, for the first time, virtually practically setting up restrictions for non-residents entering their jurisdiction. Um, equality Rights Renew is going to deal with more thoroughly, but the particular issue that at CCLA we're very concerned about, and in fact have active litigation about, is on the ability of the homeless to obey the dictates to stay home. Um, and so we're litigating to make sure that in shelters, there's actually the ability to um, respect the same physical distancing rules that the rest of us are being asked to abide by. And then of course, my personal area of expertise and interest is around privacy and surveillance. And this is an area where there's massive impact um, 
not just in the present, but you know, the concern is that it's going to be something that goes on moving forward for months and potentially years to come. Both because um, we're engaging in, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. Okay. The, main, the main reason is the public conversations around contact tracing. The idea that in a health emergency, it's important to be able to track a virus and we can use technological tools to do that, um, but in a way that is actually about tracing not just the virus, but humans and watching human behavior as they move through public spaces as things open up. Uh, so those are some of the, the top areas at this point that I think we need to talk about. Good. We'll, we'll have some chance to explore them. Uh, Stephanie, um, you know, there are a number of proposals for using surveillance technologies, such as some that, uh, that Brenda just mentioned, to deal with the current pandemic. Uh, could you share with us your thoughts about in what situations and for what purposes or uses are technologies potentially useful? And in what ones are they not or are they potentially harmful? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jim. Um, I think as privacy advocates, uh, we always look at these surveillance technologies and these great ideas for tracking us. Uh, we, we look at it as the camel's nose under the tent. The first and the primary fear is that we will never get people to stop gathering the data, using the data, sharing the data uh, once they start because everybody can find a use somewhere for data. So that's a general overall concern. Um, it's the camel's nose. But there's some data that just isn't worth gathering. And I, I, I rode down uh, to my studio here at home listening to my beloved CBC where they were talking on Radio Noon about these uh, cell phone apps where you have your Bluetooth gathering every contact that you've been in touch with. I, I can't believe we can't kill that crazy idea off. Uh, Ross Anderson at Cambridge uh, in, in, his, in his blog, um, Pale, Pale Blue Light uh, series, has basically taken the air out of those tires. Uh, Blue, Blue, Bluetooth is a pretty promiscuous device for gathering data. It's going to track every other Bluetooth near your cell phone. And that doesn't mean that you have potentially contaminated someone when you're, uh, when you're positive for this virus. So how much bad data are you going to collect even if uh, a group of students don't fasten their, uh, as he points out, fasten their cell phones to the neighborhood dog and send them around a park, you are getting a lot of useless data. And I worry that we are going to drop our social distancing, which actually works, uh, and, and, and adopt some cell phone app that may or may not work. There are obviously all the downsides of the cell phone app, including whether it can be hacked, whether it's secure, whether the encryption is really encryption, whether the tokens are truly anonymous, which is almost impossible, you know. So I won't go into the technical problems with that, but it's just a dumb idea because if we are using it to enable us to get out there and move around our cities more, uh, it's going to be gathering bucket loads of bad data and very, very few uh, bits of good data. And I mean, honestly, I sound like uh, an old um, geezer who doesn't like technology, far from it. But the easiest way to have meaningful tracking is to invite people, this is a volunteer scheme they're proposing after all, invite people to keep a little diary. It's not hard at the end of the day to jot down, particularly if your friendly government gave you a form to fill and jot down who you spent time with that day. Keep it to yourself. And if you get diagnosed, hand it over and have your contacts uh, contacted rather than every car in the parking lot that your, um, that your cell phone walks by in your purse. So I, I kind of think that one's a bad technology. Now, what would be useful is, uh, and not to say that I'm not nervous and worried about artificial intelligence. That's the area where I'm working the most now. Uh, that and uh, I can, but um, uh, we need very powerful technology to pull the data together from the provinces and the municipalities about where the outbreaks are. I mean, just keeping track uh, 
of who's sick and who isn't the regions where I don't mean tracking people's cell phones to your, to your address. I mean, the regions where uh, there are little flares of outbreaks that would be useful uh, in order, you know, you can catch that very early and predict your supply chain in advance with powerful uh, technology. The supply chain is proving to be one of the weaker points in not just uh, the COVID tracking, but also in our uh, food chains. So uh, that kind of technology that can help us manage uh, data flows and, and goods flows, that would be very useful. That's a standard data management uh, practice and it doesn't involve, well, it could involve some personal information, but it's much less likely to uh, involve surveillance of individuals. So that, those are my preliminary thoughts on that. Okay. Well, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, we'll come back to some of those, I'm sure, especially the proximity uh, tracking. Um, to kick off uh, your section, Renu, um, some people have called the pandemic the great equalizer, while others have called it the great revealer. The latter note that uh, the pandemic has had a disparate impact on vulnerable groups and revealed cracks in our social safety net. Could you talk a bit about uh, some of the key human rights issues at play here? Yeah, so, um, you know, when you uh, head an organization that uh, is focused on equality and discrimination, um, what you're often looking at in these situations is how are people actually being impacted on the ground. And I think there's sort of three areas where I think we've sort of seen what started as maybe a great equalizer turn into the great revealer. And that's around kind of who is stigmatized um, in relation to the pandemic, uh, whether it's because um, they are associated with a group who is associated with COVID-19. So who's stigmatized? Who is able to adopt public health guidances? Um, so to Brenda's point, um, like is everyone similarly situated so that they can actually benefit from public health guidance in the same way? And then thirdly, you know, as government starts to need to kind of manage um, resources that are not infinite, healthcare resources, other re resources, how do they decide to um, decide who's going to benefit from different schemes that they put in place to manage the pandemic? And does that have a differential impact on some groups? So, you know, I, I might just actually run very quickly through a bit of a timeline of the commissions um, work on this because I think it kind of reveals the way this is a slowly evolving problem where new issues keep arising and, and people need to kind of keep being critical and, piv and pivot to address those. So, you know, in January, the commission re released its first statement on COVID-19. That was before there were any confirmed cases one or two. And that statement was about discrimination and harassment of um, East Asian people, uh, whether it be online or in person, because um, what we knew was that this was sort of seen as the quote unquote Chinese virus and that people of East Asian origin were being targeted as carriers. Um, in March, you know, February, March, what we started to see was employers starting to ask questions around, um, you know, if my employee is presenting with symptoms, is it discrimination to ask them to, to, to send them home? Is COVID-19 even a disability for which accommodations should flow from employers? Um, which it is. Um, you know, in April, we started looking at this question about the differential impact. So we started looking at people with pre-existing risk factors, the elderly, people with disabilities, um, and whether they were going to be disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. We know that social condition is a huge predictor of who is going to um, ultimately get the virus, transmit the virus. So you know, homeless people, people in remote First Nations communities that don't have water. Um, we also know that certain employment status is a risk factor. Frontline workers, not just doctors, but often, um, you know, cleaners, grocery clerks, um, and many of these people tend to be women, um, and they often are racialized women or other vulnerable newcomers. 
um, congregate living situations, which we can talk about in more detail. But, you know, I think we're all aware of the really big issues around the spread of COVID-19 um, in long-term care homes, in shelters, and in correctional facilities. And again, when we scratch between the surface, who is in those homes um, or in those situations, often it is the most vulnerable people in our society, people with addictions, mental health issues, who may be Indigenous, racialized, um, or, or, or otherwise. And then now in May, you know, we're starting to look at how the government management of the pandemic may have disparate impacts. So some of the privacy issues, um, you know, Brenda and Stephanie are talking about, but we're looking at issues like the, the Ontario just, um, you know, is starting to put forward a triage protocol. So in the event that um, we don't have sufficient ICU beds to treat everyone, does the fact that you have a disability mean that you don't get access to an ICU bed because you have less likelihood of surviving after the pandemic? So there's some real ethical, legal, moral questions that all come together when you start to talk about reaching the capacity of our systems and having to make hard decisions about who's going to benefit from government supports and programs. So, you know, I think the last piece that we're also emerging set of issues is, you know, demographic data collection, human rights oversight, like when is the government actually going to turn its mind to making sure that when we come out of this pandemic, we have a clear understanding of who was most impacted and how to plan for the future. And then as we reopen the economy um, and, and people start going back to work, again, issues around who gets flagged for testing, who, um, you know, is being, um, who, who gets flagged for testing, who is caught up in, you know, emergency measure enforcement. So I think um, all of this just to say that I think that we are seeing all sorts of different human rights issues almost revealed through the pandemic. And I think it's important to say that these human rights issues existed before the pandemic. Um, you know, issues of racism against uh, minority communities, issues about the state of our long-term care homes and correctional facilities, uh, issues about racial profiling and policing. And that's why, you know, I think that that concept of the great revealer is very useful because, it, you know, the pandemic didn't create these vulnerabilities, but it has certainly made them more obvious and deadly quite honestly, for most, some of the most marginalized and vulnerable communities. Thank you. I mean, what, what you're saying, and, and it relates to what both Brenda and Stephanie were talking about, is it's always a challenge, as we all know, to build support for civil liberties and human rights in the best of times. Crises in general, and a pandemic in particular, become an occasion when many, including many in government, say, well, I'm committed to that, but we just don't have the luxury of, of uh, respecting civil liberties or respecting human rights in this instance for this reason or that reason. I think that's the challenge that, that we're going to want to explore more in this discussion. Yeah, yeah, I might want to just respond to that with a quick example. So um, you mentioned in my bio that I've done a lot of work around solitary confinement in, in prisons and, um, you know, taking the position that government shouldn't be using solitary confinement. So, um, but of course we know that the governments consistently do use solitary confinement, they overuse solitary confinement. So when the pandemic hit, of course, you know, Ontario's correctional authority said to us, well, we don't know what to do because you've told us not to use solitary confinement. And I said, well, this might be a situation where you could use, I wouldn't call it solitary confinement, but you could use separation of, of particular people within an institution. But the problem is when you overuse those crisis management tools in non-crisis situations, they become less available to use in the crisis situation they were intended for. And I think that's what we're seeing with the homeless shelters as well is, you know, these are meant to be the last resort. They're meant to be for transient people. They meant meant to be for people who are about to get into housing. But once they become people's living places for months and years, it raises all sorts of different issues about um, 
how to manage the spread of the pandemic in those kinds of environments. So I think it, it, it is what you're saying that, you know, it sort of revealed the, the problems that we had accepted almost the status quo and now we're seeing that when you actually get into an emergency operating social safety nets like they are emergency services actually creates all sorts of problems well um i'd like to turn to tim yeah. because um the pandemic uh, the uh, just the unprecedented nature scale of it is frightening to all of us is overwhelming um, and in the midst of this ca uh, pandemic, we're hearing more, Tim, a, a lot of world leaders and others using the metaphor of war to deal with this infectious disease. I mean, China's premier swore a war uh, uh, to, that he was going to wage a people's war, those were his words, on the coronavirus. And as we know, Donald Trump likes to refer to himself as a wartime president. Uh, India's prime minister invoked the imagery of an 18 day, an epic 18 day. Uh, battle in in history, saying that India it aims to win the war against the coronavirus in 21 days. And while uh, our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has told the House of Commons that this is not a war, he went on to wartime rhetoric that the quote the front lines are everywhere unquote and that we stand united in our resolve to do what we must until COVID-19 is defeated. Could you share with us some of your concerns and thoughts about likening our response to this disease to a war? Definitely, thanks, Jim. And yeah, thanks so much for uh, inviting me onto this panel. It's really, as, as Brenda mentioned, these are, it's an amazing group of people we've been able to bring together and such a crucial time to be talking about, uh, talking about these issues. Um, so yeah, at, at the ICLMG, our work is on, you know, the impact of the war on terror on civil liberties in Canada and internationally. and. So this idea of using the war metaphor is something that we've been looking at for a while and is really troubling when we talk about, um, well, almost in, in so many circumstances, but right now when we're talking about a disease, about a virus, to liken it to a war, you know, people say that, you know, it's just words, it's a way to rally people, but those words have really um, important consequences. Um, and so I wanted to go through a few ideas of what some of those consequences are that we've seen in other, you know, war on terror, war on drugs, even when we talk about health issues in terms of war on cancer, war on AIDS, HIV, AIDS, it's, um, there's the repercussions to using that language that really have an impact in how people react to them and how society accepts limits on their civil liberties and human rights going forward. Um, so first, it, it can be well-intentioned. The idea can be that we're rallying people behind the war effort uh, to come together in a sense of unity. But at the same time, war at its heart is divisive. A war needs an enemy. In this case, the enemy, the most obvious one is, is a virus. Medically, it's difficult even, as you said, Justin Trudeau said, that uh, uh, the virus will be defeated. It's questionable how even medically speaking, and you know, I'm, I'm not an expert, so I won't go into depth, but can we defeat a virus? And what does it mean? And we've seen that when we say we're gonna defeat terror, we're going to defeat uh, drugs, what it ends up doing is, is basically entering us into this long lasting protracted battle, on one hand against what could be considered a, a metaphorical enemy, but then ends up having very real world repercussions on people who get tied into that and this idea spreads. So is somebody who has the virus part of the enemy? Um, is it people who are uh, believed to be spreading the virus? And so then we get into the questions of, you know, people wanting to report on their neighbors and being hypervigilant and the surveillance issues around, um, you know, how do we track each other and making sure that we give up those rights in order to be able to better defeat this enemy. Um, the other uh, thing that we're seeing, and it's just come out, you know, more in the last few days is, uh, pointing to others as an enemy. So for example, in the United States, especially in other places, China is becoming the enemy. As Renu mentioned, East Asians in you know, the United States and in, in many countries have been viewed as somehow part of this enemy. Um, you know, there was a report over the weekend that the Five Eyes Intelligence Network had this dossier that showed that China had created the virus. Um, in a lab and that that's how it got out and whether or not it was bioengineered that was quickly refuted but when we're talking and using this idea of a war people are going to latch on to those ideas that we need to find the root of that war and confront this enemy and so it's a it's a it's a dangerous way of framing it um, because it isn't about confronting the health impacts 
um, it turns into a way of, of finding something that we need to defeat. The other point um, beyond having this divisiveness is that war is often and you know almost always used as a reason to give up our rights unquestioningly. And so it allows for these and as you know, uh, Brenda mentioned, these are you know, really exceptional times that we live in. And it's true that there will be exceptional measures that are necessary. But what's important in that is that they continue to, there continues to be transparency, that there continues to be questioning and debate um, and real-time oversight and accountability of those, of those issues. Um, but when we're talking about a war, often we're told that we need to you know, rally behind the government, rally behind um, even medical professionals who, um, you know, we need to support, but also there still needs to be the, the, these debates and questions around what the impacts of those are going to be on, on, um, on our rights and civil liberties. And then finally, I'd say the last thing is that, um, as has already been, you know, highlighted by, by, by Stephanie and others, is that um, we're presented with these as, a, as an exceptional, you know, tool and that the war will, will begin and will lose. As you mentioned in India, um, Modi had said that it would be a, a, a 21 day war. We know this isn't gonna take 21 days. And often what ends up happening is that these continue on and even, you know, uh, as we've seen that even if they do declare somehow a victory, um, these exceptional powers don't just disappear. And often they are never rolled back. We've seen that with the war on terror. We've seen that with the war on drugs, that exceptional surveillance powers that were meant to confront and address a particular issue become permanent. Um, and those rights that we were convinced in that instant that um, were expendable, all of a sudden become, uh, an, you know, become a, a privilege rather than, than, a, than a right or, or a norm. And um, so I think those are some things that we're, we're keeping an eye on and, and that really tie into this idea of, of that we're at war with, uh, with a virus. Thank you, Tim. I, mean, I think you've, you've really hit it right uh, directly uh, in terms of the concern. That is, civil liberties and human rights, it's always been a struggle to obtain them, to have them recognized. The 1948 uh, adoption by the United Nations of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was one of the great achievements in human history. Uh, but they're always under attack, being questioned. Uh, they're not something we ever achieve. We always struggle to achieve them. and. Uh, a crisis that gets defined as a war or as exceptional becomes a license to say, well, we're committed to those rights, but in this instance, we can't afford them. Um, and a number of you have, have mentioned several examples of that. I don't know which ones you'd like to delve into, but for example, uh, um, Stephanie and to some extent, Brenda, were talking about these proximity tracking acts, you know, we apps that will let us know who people have met. and. And uh, uh, there are actually there's a group at the University of Montreal, uh, another one in Ottawa. There's about six groups worldwide, including Google and Apple, working together on that to develop apps that will track uh, that raise fundamental questions. Uh, and I think we have to address for these things that concern us. Um, what a, you know the the questions we need, we need to ask, for example, is first of all, will they work? And secondly, if they do work, are they worth the price? And if they are necessary, as, as you were suggesting, Tim, what are the restrictions we're gonna place on them from the outset uh, in terms of oversight, in terms of temporary nature of the use, what's gonna to happen to the data that are collected uh, using those? Um, and it's often difficult, and I don't know if any of you wanna comment about this, about the challenges you face in even raising these kinds of questions is somehow you're being disloyal during a war when you should just willingly give up these things for the good of, of everybody else. And, and uh, I think, as you said, Tim, uh, uh, these are treated as luxuries or privileges rather than fundamental rights that should only be given up uh, temporarily in the most extreme of circumstances and where there's clear justification uh, for how they can work. So I don't, you know, I don't know what any of you would like to address. I leave it to you, whether it's the, the proximity tracking acts or the proposal the federal government is looking at at criminalizing the spread of misinformation uh, or how they're going to have this uh, way of, of deciding who uh, has uh, certain rights based on their ability or age uh, uh, or the rights of people in court now. I mean, there's so many aspects. So would anyone like to jump in on one or another of those and 
and just elaborate a little bit about uh, what the concern is and what we should do and use one of those as an example. Could I jump in, Jim? Uh, sure. I, I want to hark back also to uh, what I think is a grim, hard reality that we should face. Uh, I mean, I spent about 30 years in government fighting for privacy, and uh, it's very hard to do that in economic hard times. Well, mm -hmm. we're going to be looking at an economic situation that is utterly unparalleled in history, and there's no sign that some of our key economies in Canada are not going to recover. We, we're already I won't go into it. Right. So let's be real about what we can roll back. That is one of the things that's propelling me to make sure we don't start something because we are not going to have the troops on the ground uh, to, to fight this. Sorry to use yet another. Uh, <laughs> you see how it creeps in. I, 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 I listened to Tim with great interest because my, my next real issue that I, I want to focus on is facial recognition being linked to whether or not you've got this so-called totally unproven, thank goodness for Dr. Teresa, uh, who's already panned it, the notion that you can have a passport to travel because you've had an inoculation. Well, A, we haven't got the vaccine. B, it might not work on every everybody. And then what happens when it doesn't work on you? When you're like me, old, and the flu shot doesn't work. I do my duty, a word that's creeping into all the rhetoric, my civic duty, not my civil liberties, my civic duty. I do my civic duty and have my flu shot, but it doesn't always work. So there's a file on me saying, oh, got the flu anyway. Take the new uh, COVID shot, doesn't work. Am I gonna be restricted to house arrest? I. I I feel very deeply the concern over solitary confinement because for old people, uh, either in nursing homes with not enough care and no visits or in your own home, even worse, no care and no visits, that's solitary confinement. And I, you know, I think people are willing to make a short-term sacrifice and not go out to keep the load off the hospitals. But if we get to the point where People who are weaker than others aren't allowed to go out in case they get it. So we're talking the disabled, the elderly, the, uh, the, the mentally uh, disabled who, who might not be able to appreciate risk situations. All of those people, we don't want to get to the point where we have your civic duty to keep folks like us in. And I think that's, that's a real concern. Uh, Brenda, with regard to... Um issues around uh, various technologies. I, I mean, I really have a sense that there's a, uh, sort of a magical belief in the effectiveness of technologies. Uh, and I agree with Stephanie's characterization, most of these uh, of the plans for proximity tracking apps using Bluetooth. Uh, I mean, I'm sitting in, in my condo uh, and my Bluetooth will pick up the Bluetooth of the person living next door who I don't see, who I don't talk to, who I don't come across, but because he's eight feet away from me with a wall between us, it will show that I, uh, how, what, what do you and what has the CCLA been saying about what protections do we need to build and what criteria do we need to uh, uh, use in trying to judge and respond to governments about proposals to use any of a variety of these uh, technological uh, devices or initiatives to as a solution? That's just a little teensy tiny question. <laughs> I know, well, <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, I would respond to at least two threads of that. First of all, I think that we're seeing sort of, at the same time, rhetoric coming from governments that says, oh, and we've heard our prime minister say this, Canadians care deeply about their privacy and their data security, and we're committed to protecting that but we might need to do something um, about contact tracing. Um, so privacy is being framed as both an important public value and also potentially a barrier to um, taking actions that are in the public benefit. And I think it's really important to stamp on that and stamp on it hard. So privacy laws and privacy as a right and a principle um, is not a barrier to taking effective action against disease. And in fact, we have 
laws related to public health that explicitly permit information sharing about um, disease transmissions and progress. Um, what privacy is a barrier to, if it's a barrier to anything, is unnecessary information sharing or sharing that's disproportionate mm -hmm. um, in relation to the risk it causes for individuals or groups in society versus the public benefit that we get. So privacy law we have to identify as a safeguard, as a first best line of defense. And it's unfortunate that in Canada, our privacy laws are a bit out of date. Um, mm -hmm. so they aren't as strong as we might like them to be in terms of providing that defense, but they're fundamental and we need to um, hang on to that idea that they're necessary. Um, the other thread would be more specifically around arguments about contact tracing. And I think the fundamental question that we're not asking and that we need to start asking and demanding answers to is, is it going to provide the information genuinely needed by public health to help them effectively address this crisis? Uh, because we've heard politicians say, oh, we all know that contact tracing is important. And we've heard technology companies say, absolutely, technology can be designed in ways to facilitate what we know is an absolutely essential activity, which is contact tracing. What we're not hearing, at least in Canada, is public health officials standing up and saying, uh, we believe that there is a way that technologically mediated contact tracing will help us in a way that we can't do on our own with our tried and true methods of talking to people. Uh, so the first question needs to be, is there genuine indication from the experts in public health uh, that this is going to fill a gap that they have? And yeah. the silence on that question has been deafening in Canada. That's right. But that's, that's where I think the, the uh, fascination with new technologies uh, is really harmful because people don't ask the really tough question, can this possibly work? Uh, and even if it works, will it be effective? Will it meet a, a need that can't be better met other ways or adequately met other ways? I don't, oh, think, yeah. those, I don't think those hard questions are, are often asked of, of these attractive technologies that the Googles and Apples and others are, are peddling or uh, various designers of them are peddling. Uh, they just look really fancy and wonderful, but uh, uh, I, I'm not sure they're subjected to the kind of critical, critical scrutiny they should be. We're scared. Yeah. We're scared oh. at home. Yeah. We want an app for that. Yeah, um, exactly. The public is crying for it. Um, and governments are feeling, I know that governments are feeling a great deal of pressure to respond. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is when we're scared and when we're under pressure, we're not likely to make good decisions. And for something as complicated as this, where there are issues around how we protect privacy of individuals, there are issues of whether or not Bluetooth beacons even work in the way that we want them to. Mm -hmm. There are issues as to whether or not, um, even if they do work, they're going to provide the right information that the public health needs. There are issues about whether or not information can truly be anonymized or de-identified in ways that are genuinely privacy protective. And particularly with location information, I think there's a decade of scholarship that says it probably can't. Um, and in that really complex set of complex technical situ or considerations, you're, interject you're introducing it into a complex socio-technical system of public health, uh, where there are public health needs, where there are fears, um, and where there are, frankly, supply shortages. So one issue with contact tracing is if you have an app and I walk, things have opened up in our world. I go to work. I take public transit. I'm in contact with, let's be modest and say 200 people on my way into work. Tomorrow I'm diagnosed as positive. As, a, as doing my civic duty, I have installed the app and at the point that I get my positive diagnosis, I push out the information that my test is positive. At that point, what, hap what happens to the 200 people who get the notice that says, oh, you're at risk because you were in contact with an anonymous person who's now tested positive? Do they call public health? If they do, does public health have the capacity to answer all of those calls and tell people what to do? Do they go for a test? If they do, do we have the capacity to engage in that level of testing? And remember, my 200 contacts are added to Renu's 200 contacts, added to Stephanie's 200 contacts, added to Tim's 200 contacts, as they also test positive in the same time period. So 
the question oh, that, yeah, as, as Renu also mentioned, this is assuming everybody has an iPhone or a Samsung phone or some other kind of smartphone. There's lots of people who, who can't afford those, who don't have them. I mean, I, uh, it, it, it just is based on some sort of assumption of, uh, that ignores this, uh, an important segment of society, which is uh, not even part of this discussion. This uh, can I, can the I, curious thing I heard on the Radio Noon Show was the idea of giving people cell phones in order to enable them to do that. Now, uh, hands up, who wouldn't take a new iPhone 10 if you were offered it uh, under these circumstances? So I got, as a privacy advocate, I got a little worried when I heard that idea. I just wanted to interrupt to make one point here. Um, from a, if I were a government, and I'm not, let's be clear, uh, the notion that I could give everybody some sort of thing they could have in their pocket that was gonna, would take away the fear and may I say hysteria of running into somebody with COVID, that's very attractive. It's, 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 it's hypnotic. The fact that it doesn't work, and all you have to do is read Ross Anderson's paper to, to know it can't work, but if you don't believe him, gather the data and just see how crappy it is. And then to me, but that's, that's what we're fighting against. The illusion of of, of, of safety in this really very dangerous time. We should be focusing on protecting ourselves, not tracking our neighbors, you know? And, and, and then the problem that when you start getting the hundreds of thousands of alerts you're gonna get, uh, because it won't be just yesterday's train load of people, it'll be the two weeks worth of train loads of people that's thousands right there on the Toronto tan transit system. I mean, it might work in a village, but it's sure as heck not going to work in a city. And that's where the pandemic is, is, is roosting. But then yeah. people are then not going to have faith in their government that gave them the silly phone. It'll be like the Amber Alerts that are sometimes waking you up six times a night. People are mad at them. When you get woke, woken up for, uh, for 200 COVID alerts, Renu, you were started. Did you? Have a yeah, question I just all? wanted to jump in. Um, not as much on the contract tracing apps, but kind of picking up Tim and Jim on your comments about kind of how. So I think we've been talking a lot about the the um, limits on civil liberties or individual freedoms as a result of COVID nineteen. But I think one thing that intellectually complicates COVID-19 maybe from other situations like the war on terror is that the right to life is engaged for people who in terms of not getting COVID-19, right? So you actually are in a bit of a competing rights situation where you say, okay, well, we all have a right to life that's engaged because we don't want to get a deadly illness and we have a right to not get a deadly illness if the government can prevent that. And so like how much are we willing to limit civil liberties for the right to life for all of us? But I think where that becomes really interesting is when you realize that we accept limitations on our right to health and right to life in other scenarios like the seasonal flu, um, like you know, and so I guess what is concerning to me, and you were kind of talking about the chill on sort of even having these conversations, is sort of saying, you know, at some point, do we accept that we may have a higher mortality rate because we decide not to limit, limit civil liberties as much as you know, others have. And I think that's what we're seeing in Sweden and some other places. And I guess th that is an interesting question that I think is hap it's kind of underneath the surface in Canada, but we aren't really addressing it head on. Um, and I think that's in a way what distinguishes the situation from the war on terror, where the average person as much as the government told us there was a threat to our life at every minute, you know, the average person didn't feel that that was actually 
a true threat. And so they felt that there was an overstep on the civil liberties. I think what's a little bit different now is if you ask the average person, they actually think they are at risk and that there is a real threat. And so it justifies and allows this encroachment on civil liberties because I think the nature of the risk is more real to the average person. And I think we haven't really talked about whether the average person person has to accept some risk to their health or life in a balance against civil liberties or other rights. The <laughs> other thing I would just add to this, and I just want to throw it out there is, you know, we're talking about civil liberties and I think there are some real threats to civil liberties. I think folks who are talking about social and economic rights, the right to housing, the right to clean water, they are actually feeling like this is a hopeful moment because governments are actually starting to think that maybe they have to realize those rights as a way of man managing future pandemics. So I just wanted to throw out there that there's a bit of a, um, you know, two edges to this debate, because I think some people think we might actually more effectively realize some social and economic rights as we pull out of this. Tim, did you want to comment on the first half of what uh, Renee was talking about? Yeah, definitely. And th thanks, Renew. That's really an, um, you know, such an important point to, to, to bring to this. And, and I think, um, you know, as we've talked about, it, these are exceptional, exceptional circumstances. The, the, the comparison to the war on terror isn't a, it, you know, definitely isn't a, a complete one. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I would agree with you that we need to be balancing and we need to be talking about how this is an exceptional circumstance and that the threat of dying of COVID-19 is, is clearly much higher, and especially in certain populations, than, than the threat of terrorism, killing, especially in a country, you know, talking about the Canadian context, you know, regardless, you know, not thinking about, you know, the, the context in other countries, but, you know, so clearly we need to be acknowledging that there are exceptions we need to make in terms of our rights to be able to support each other and those who are most vulnerable. And I guess one of the, the concerns that um, around this idea of the war is that if anything, I would think that would undermine, you know, the idea that we're coming together to support people who are more vulnerable to it rather than seeing them as potential spreaders, you know, as people okay. who isolated and, and, and cut off and, and, and kept away from the population. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I agree with you that it's, it's um, that, you know, we need to be looking at it in a context where uh, there is a real threat to life and that we do need to bring in effective tools and effective limitations in order to make sure that people's right to life is, and, and security and health are, are protected. I think that goes to the heart of one of the questions of around whether or not the proposed solutions, contact tracing, Bluetooth apps, or te technological solutions to contact tracing, not the, the, the regular systems of contact tracing, whether or not those are actually effective tools for protecting that right to life. Yeah. So that when we're talking about those exceptions and limitations on rights, that they're being given up it, for, for the right reasons. And not because there's a push just, well, if we collect more information, then you know, through technological uh, means, then for sure we'll be able to address this better. So we all better do that right now. Um, so yeah, I, but I agree with you. It's, uh, it's coming to that answer, coming to the answer of, of where those limitations are. It's, a, it's one that I think we're all really engaged in right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Renu, I think the, the issue you raised is really a central one that we have to uh, all confront. And I think all of you have in one way or another in your comments. Um, there is no such thing as absolute rights. Uh, there are always limits on our rights in various ways. Uh, the, I think the danger of a time like this is that it's portrayed that the pandemic is so serious we don't have to pay attention to the nuance, to, the, to, the, um, uh, to what's the least harmful way to do something. You should just in the good of fighting the pandemic, fighting the war, just give up those rights and let the government or whoever's in charge just do what they have to do. That's, so, where, it Jim, becomes, I think that's that, where it becomes just, dangerous. So the, I think that's because historically the right to life has been a right that is not subject to limits, right? It, it is the right that usually um, people say there is no limit on the right to life. You cannot justify a limit on the right to life. You know, the Canadian courts have never found a justifiable limit 
on the right to life. And so I think the question is even more primary, like is the right to life actually engaged by the pandemic? And because obviously it is for particular individuals, but is it kind of for each person such that we are gonna give up our own civil liberties? So I think anyway, I just think that it's a very, it's a complex idea. I just, I just worry when you frame it a little bit like that, because in a sense, our traffic safety laws grew out of a recognition of the right to life. Uh, That's exactly what I mean is, do we need to particularize the right to life to a person for it to kind of coalesce as that kind of right? Or Because I think right now governments are sort of using the right to life almost for anyone and everyone, no matter the situation. And that's where exactly, Jim, where you get to is, well, every, you know, every restriction in our, on our activity, speeding, fines, bylaws, they are all kind of grounded in health and safety often. That's right. And does that always trigger the right to life, right? Well, so I think, but as yeah. you know, I mean, in, in, in the commission and in our legal system, we've worked that out to some extent, saying that there are various tests normally mm-hmm. that one has to go through before a right can be limited. And it has to be limited in the most yeah. marginal way. Uh, Brenda was talking about proportionality. Um, and we can't, lo- I, I guess my point would be, mm-hmm. and I think you're all saying the same thing, yeah. is we can't give up those questions mm-hmm. and those standards and those tests just because it's a pandemic. So yes. if there is a proposal to limit certain rights that we otherwise have, they have to be able to meet the same test that this is effective. It's not, there's not a less intrusive way of mm-hmm. solving the problem and so forth. And it's just in the context of the pandemic or in the context of war, I get the sense that, that um, there's less patience for, for raising those kinds of issues uh, in, a, in a war. Well, just have to give for the good of society. You forget all that stuff and just let us run around. And then as several of you mentioned, we're left with a situation after the pandemic we've abrogated all those rights, do we ever get them back? Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if anyone has a, I'm gonna to turn to the audience in a minute for some questions. Uh, is there anything, last comment anyone would like to make before we get into responding to the audience's questions? Well, I think in response to those concerns and that conversation, one of the things that I've been saying and I really believe it's true is that in overall, Canadians have responded extraordinarily well as a people to this crisis. Um, What's remarkable is not how many people are out in the park getting tickets, but how many people are staying home and obeying (laughs) restrictions. Um, And I believe that that is a function of the fact that we live in a mature democracy with a solid foundation of shared values that in part come from the ways that our rights have been protected and identified over the years. So we're Mm -hmm as a country, as a nation, as a people, responding in, I think, very positive ways overall in this time of crisis as a function of the ways that our society has protected our rights in the past, which has given us an understanding of how important it is to come together and and work together to get ourselves all through this crisis. And any actions that have run the risk of eroding those shared common values or changing the ways in which rights are protected coming out of this crisis is going to impact our ability to do this again, either to get through this together now or to do it again in the future. And I think there's fairly universal acknowledgement that this isn't a one-off, that these kind of crises are increasingly going to come up in society. So I think part of the conversation really has to be how do we make sure whatever the big questions we're dealing with, how do we deal with them in such a way that when we come out the other side, we are not weaker, we are not less than what we are, um, but that we have a a continuing shared understanding of social values that include protections for rights and freedoms. Can I just say- um, I want to turn to the audience. Is that okay? Or do yeah. you, if you have one thing you want to say quickly. That's no, I was just going to say, I think it, it, it speaks to why we need to build in human rights accountability throughout and, and kind of think of those 
like build spaces that are safe for human rights experts to raise these concerns directly with government mm -hmm. um, at situation tables in crisis management teams so that it isn't happening at the end um, kind of as enforcement or but rather it's sort of baked in to how governments and others decide to manage these. Well, and Tim, as the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group has emphasized off of why oversight bodies mm -hmm. are so important. So as these decisions are being considered, there need to be human rights advisory committees and oversight bodies to make sure that those things are protected as we go along and yeah. we try to recapture them at the end. Yes. Okay, um, Ange, um, Ange Holmes is the coordinator for the Center for Free Expression who's been monitoring the question and answer uh, line. Uh, do you have a question from uh, the audience that you'd like to share with the panel? And uh, if it's directed to one person, identify who that is. If it's for the whole panel, uh, perhaps you could make that clear too. Uh, yes, there's quite a few questions. I'm not sure if we'll get to all of them. Um, but uh, the first question is from Avi, and Avi says, I'm an international student in Canada, and I was told that the reality is since we, tens of thousands of us across the country, cannot vote, uh, we do not have a say and our voices won't be heard. How do we respond to this discriminatory remark? Who would like to take that one on? Okay, go ahead, Renu. Um, I think that that is probably reality insofar as politically marginalized groups or people who do not have a political voice tend to have trouble raising their concerns to the level um, where politicians hear them and respond to them. And I think, you know, for sure, international students, I mean, my friends who work at universities have said, you know, international students are going to be deeply affected by this crisis. Um, you know, many weren't able to go home, many are, who are home won't be able to come back. And I think, you know, this question really just speaks to kind of my opening remarks in really thinking who, who is affected by the pandemic, but who has really no voice or, or status to bring forward their concerns. Another group, um, similar group is, you know, foreign workers, people who come into farms every year to, you know, pick, pick tomatoes and, and strawberries. And we've heard concerns from those groups who say, you know, we don't vote. We have very little political capital. Um, we need the money to come every year, but like, how are we going to be protected? So I do think that it, it, it kind of falls upon groups like CCLA, the Human Rights Commission, ICLMG, and others to kind of look for those communities who are voiceless and and try to bring those issues into the public consciousness. There's also things that individuals, so for example, for international students, uh, there are organizations like the Canadian Federation of Students, which actively advocate on behalf of international students and brings concerns and issues of international students to government's attention to public attention and their international student organizations at many of the individual universities. So the other advice I'd have to the questioner is uh, as an individual, yes, as a non-citizen, you can't vote, but there are a variety of organizations uh, that you can express your concerns to and be part of their advocacy around those issues. Ange, do you have another question for us? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, the next one is from a guest and it's, uh, they ask uh, for folks to comment on the gathering of race-based health data and how that can be done legally, ethically, and with sensitivity. I guess that's a question for the <laughs> Chief Commissioner of the Human Rights Commission. Uh, yeah, um, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, you know, we've, we've taken the position that government should be collecting race and other disaggregated human rights-based data on the pandemic. Um, at least in Ontario, what we know is that the government has not mandated uh, disaggregated data collection in the health sector. Um, and you know, the, way, the best way to do that, I understand, is to link that data to your OHIP card so that anytime you go and access a government health service, your OHIP card can tell the government essentially your race, your sex, whether you have a disability, et cetera. Um, in the absence of that, I think we need to be creative and kind of not let perfection be the enemy of progress. And what we've called on the government to do is to at least collect 
demographic data on testing, on, the, on who gets tested, on who tests positive, on ICU admissions, hospital and ICU admissions, and on deaths. And, you know, right now they're collecting data on age and sex. But, you know, in the United States, we've seen that the pandemic has, you know, really disproportionately affected Black and Hispanic communities. And I think that we want to see the government really think about how, even in the absence of OHIP collected data, the best kind of gold standard, is there a shortcut here mm -hmm. that we can address for the pandemic? Okay, Ange, another question? Uh, yeah, the next one is from Sibel. Uh, how are tech companies and those who support them using COVID as an opportunity to advance their already existing long-term agendas in a way that could put communities at risk? Brenda looks like she's anxious to answer that. I bet, I don't know if Stephanie is as well. Does one of you want to start? Uh, I'll start. So, I mean, it's ironic that we're having this conversation on a platform that's been rather pilloried for both poor privacy protections and poor security protections, uh, although they've also been sort of very responsive to those concerns, um, either out of, you know, genuine concern or out of concern for their bottom line or a mix of both. Uh, so it's it's a reality that as we're working from home, as we're living our social lives online, uh, that we're actually further enrolling ourselves in the systems of surveillance capitalism using platforms that we know um, make their make their money by collecting more and more information about us and figuring out how to use it in ways that may or may not be to our benefit. So that's sort of the just the reality of living life online and of our allowing over time for these systems to be developed in a way that is really harmful to personal privacy and, and individual autonomy, I think, at, at its foundation. There's probably no better example of that than the proximity trafficking apps that are brought to you by Google and Apple and others who, whose whole business is, is based on being able to monetize uh, your personal information. And what a wonderful opportunity to expand the collection of that. Uh, There's all kinds of examples. The proximity tracking apps are, are absolutely a really good one. Um, online educational tools as well. So now that we have students attending school online, I think there are very serious concerns about what tools students are being asked to use and the ways in which the policies are set up that, that do or do not support minimizing intrusions into individuals' homes um, in the process of becoming educated online. So this is a massive question that is you know, really fundamentally important and deserves a whole panel on its own, frankly. Yes, well, maybe we'll do that as one of the subsequent panels. Uh, uh, Stephanie, you wanted to join this? Uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, well, two things to directly answer the question. All companies are looking for market advantage. Uh, the IT companies aren't hurting like some of the others, but they're certainly not going to turn up a chance to uh, sell their wares. I think what we have to be really, really careful of is companies that gather data because that's more data that they're gathering. Now, Brenda mentioned uh, how out of date our data protection laws are, and they, they surely are. And most people are unaware that uh, the federal act does not cover completely the landscape. It, it, the legislative scheme brought in with the Federal Privacy Act for the private sector depended on the provinces moving forward and passing their own legislation. And for instance, I hate to pick on Ontario, but Ontario has not acted in that regard. So there's a lot of gaps of organizations that aren't covered. Uh, so we do need up, updated data protection law. The current law rests on the concept of consent. And this, I, as you can tell, I, I'm good for hours on this, having worked with <laughs> uh, So it is probably the subject of another panel. I'm not optimistic that any government anytime soon is going to embrace the very difficult, thorny problem of updating data protection law. It's not an easy thing. Getting rid of consent, you don't really want to get rid of it, but the only sort of constraint on consent for these powerful technologies, who doesn't click their doggone contract with Apple <laughs> all 75 pages? I haven't got time and I study these things and, and criticize them and counsel on them. I don't have time to read them all. So I'm darn sure the average person doesn't even look at it. That's not good enough. 
and the data protection authorities are not sufficiently empowered to say that's not good enough and go in and intervene. So as we're talking about all of these technologies, whether they're brought in temporarily or whether they're brought in permanently, we need more powers for somebody in authority to step in and say, you know what? That is not what a reasonable person, I'm quoting the clause, the only trammel on that, uh, on that consent authority, would consider appropriate under the circumstances. You know, that's not appropriate for you, Google, to gather our data and keep it forever, or you, Facebook, to gather all our contacts data and share it. You know, that's not appropriate. That's what we need. In the meantime, we're going to have to, I think, I was, I was listening to Renu on this, what do we do about the human rights impact? We need human rights impact assessments as we go along. As the emergency powers fall away, we need to do human rights impacts on everything that's resting because there will be changes in law that are still there that are not sunsetted properly. I must say that's something I'm kind of focusing on. There's been some, some very helpful analysis of what the different provincial and municipal and federal um, emergency measures are. That's great work. And we can build on that and say, okay, we need this kind of analysis and assessment or everything else that came in goes out with it. Because we're okay. going to be faced with uh, the fear of another virus coming along, and that's going to be the excuse to keep all these things going. Ange, another question. Uh, yes, this is a question from Klaus. Uh, who assesses or should assess the proportionality of the ongoing isolation measures? In Germany, the UK, and the US, a good number of doctors, immunologists, epidemiologists, and data scientists hold different views of the threat of a coronavirus found to be not more deadly than a bad seasonal flu. In addition, lawyers have started court proceedings to review the constitutionality of the lockdown policies, but public broadcasters and mass media don't report on these voices or stamp them as conspiracy theory of theorists. What are the critical journalists? Uh, where are the critical journalists in Canada, Canada? Why is there no visible parliamentary opposition at this time? Who would like to have a first kick at that one? Uh, what's hard for me and oh go ahead Tim please yeah uh, I don't think I'll touch on on all the, the the points there but I think one thing is that we're seeing is that it's it's important that that the decisions being made are, are based on on the advice of medical officers and not based on on politics and that there needs to be a balance of oversight between what medical professionals are saying and as well of um, what was brought up around human rights um, oversight and transparency and so what, because what we have on one hand is advice from medical experts, uh, chief health officers across, you know, across Canada and internationally. Um, and then we have the political reaction to it. And, and the concern is that there's this gap between what's being proposed and what's being raised as an alarm in terms of the health urgency, and then what's being brought in as a political solutions, how it's being framed politically. We might have less of a problem here in Canada than, for example, we see coming out of the United States and maybe some other countries. But at the same time, there's still that real concern um, that it's true right now, even though there is, you know, there are weekly sessions of parliament and virtual sessions of parliament, other, most of the parliamentary committees aren't meeting. Um, and if they are meeting, there's not a lot of coverage about what's going on in those parliamentary committees. Um, and I think what's been brought up about the need for independent human rights oversight is, is crucial to make sure that we know that, um, that we're getting it that we're getting it right um there was a an open letter signed by 300 organizations and experts that went out of a couple weeks ago to uh um, organized by amnesty international canada um to essentially call on all levels of government to create uh human rights based oversight mechanisms for their responses at the provincial federal and even municipal levels um and i think that would Go a long way to cut through some of the the haze around you know quote unquote conspiracy theories uh, which there are out there um, but also can be used to frame you know legitimate critiques and to cut through what are political partisan responses versus um, responses that are actually going to protect rights and 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 serve um, you know uh, medical purposes okay next question Ange. Uh, yes, another question from a guest. Who is being left out of this conversation and how can spaces be created for them to participate? And asking what the biggest examples of this are that 
uh, the public should watch for. Uh, do you have a sense from the question whether they're talking about who's being left out of the discussion we're having or who's being left out of the broader societal discussion, which I think Renu addressed a bit in her opening remarks? I assume that's what the questioner is asking. Uh, it's not very clear. So. Okay. Renu, did you want to just... Yeah, I, I mean, I think, yeah, that is that is sort of what I was talking about in terms of who's invisible, sort of, um, but yet impacted. I mean, a good example would just be the the long-term care homes, you know. We, we had a sustained discussion nationally about long-term care homes, but, you know, I don't think we heard from many people who live in long-term care homes about what that experience uh, was like um, for them. So I think, you know, always coming back to that key human rights principle about lived experience and how do we kind of capture and make sure that that's the focal point of these conversations. Um, you know, another issue is, uh, you know, the disparate impact on homeless people, people with disabilities. I mean, these are the same groups who have trouble, you know, accessing forums like this um, or being part of these debates. But I think, um, again, I think uh, that is kind of why we need to have a robust civil society response to the pandemic, but also build in, um, you know, into the pandemic management, the moments where you actively, proactively decide to go out and, and speak with those people. Like, I think it has to be proactively built in to how you assess the whole um, landscape or else it just doesn't happen. Okay. And actually, you have another question? Uh, yes, yes, there's quite a few questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, if the emergency acts were not enabled, what existing law could be used to one, strike the right balance between public health and individual freedom, and two, ensure public safety issue with existing law? And there's an example of City of Toronto bylaw allows for parts uh, to close in the interest of public safety and congestion. Brenda, do you wanna comment on that? So that's a very complicated question mm -hmm. when you're looking at national responses in a context where healthcare is a provincial responsibility um, and where privacy, for you know, for example, um, is subject to both federal law or provincial law, or sometimes both, depending on the ways that, um, you know, laws are set up in that jurisdiction. So in terms of what laws would we rely on um, specifically, I don't know. Uh, the reality is though that we do engage in a process of balancing rights and freedoms against legal objectives pub and public exec objectives all the time, whether or not we have emergency measures <laughs> in place. Um, what emergency measures acts are allowing governments to do is act more quickly uh, with less restrictions on their actions um, and proclaim things for short periods of time that might or may not be possible in a longer time frame under other kinds of uh, lawful authorities. Um, so as we move away from emergency measures and into sort of the normal state of affairs. Uh, what we need to watch for is that lawful authority for actions are, is identified um, and that there are opportunities for sort of public consultation in relation to the ways in which any new kinds of restrictions that are gonna be embedded in a more permanent way, because of course the joy of the Emergency Measures Act is that there is a time limit and all of them, that's, that's baked into that. Um, and as we move out of that regime and into the regular regime, what we need to be very sure is that any measures that are going to be enacted under more regular uh, laws or statutes are thought through really carefully in terms of whether or not they're absolutely necessary um, and whether or not, the, again, the, if they're going to introduce additional restrictions, uh, whether it's proportionate to a genuine risk to society and we need to look at that through the lens of, of rights, as we've been saying all along. And as to whether the, the limits actually will achieve their objective. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't want to be too literal here, but just in case this is kind of what the questioner was asking, like, you know, the way you challenge, you know, either government can use its emergency powers or it could have passed new laws. Um, but either way, those laws can, be challenged constitutionally in, in courts, just like 
CCLA mm -hmm. has, has started to do. Um, the problem with that approach, of course, is it's after the fact. So it's after the rights are violated, you, you go to court. And I think that brings back to Tim and, uh, and I's point that that kind of amnesty has raised, which is that's one way of doing it, right? You deal with human rights issues after they things go awry, but the other way is to actually build that in at the beginning. And I think that's what we'd want to see, regardless of whether governments are using the emergency powers or some other specific legislation that they pass uh, for this purpose. Okay, thank you. Ange, next question. Uh, yeah, this is an anonymous attendee uh, who says, here in the Maritimes especially, immediate families are separated by provincial borders. What are our rights with regards to travel across these provincial borders to access the support our families provide? Interesting question. I was just talking to a friend of mine who lives in Halifax and, and has an office in Toronto and happened to be in Toronto when the lockdown happened. And he just drove back home uh, this weekend and he had to go through three different police checkpoints and had to satisfy them that he wasn't doing anything recreational or going to his cottage or anything, but was going home. Uh, does anyone have an answer to that question? I mean, I assume these are rights that are provided under emergency legislation, uh, but uh, I, don't, I can't answer more than that. This is Stephanie. Um, I'm not the lawyer here, but I can tell you, I have a brand new grandson in Montreal that I would at least like to see through a glass window, but I can't get across the Montreal border. I've been threatening to hire a horse and go through the woods, shades of the frontier. But uh, these, are, these are powers that, they, that the governments do have under their Emergency Measures Act. And I think we're stuck, to them, uh, stuck with them until they roll them back. And it, it is unprecedented. We, we don't pull out these uh, provincial boundary laws uh, willy-nilly, you know. Okay. There's an interesting question. question about the constitutionality of these measures um, that has yet to be explored in a court. Um, mm -hmm. but, but I would just toss out there that, that there is a constitutional question there that begs to be addressed. Well, and... and it is correct to say that emergency powers can be challenged as being unconstitutional. In other words, they don't trump everything, do they? Uh, Renu, I think your, uh, your, your, your uh, mic is not on. Whoops. Sorry about that. Um, I was just going to actually say both, having just read both emergency acts, the federal and provincial recently, both of them reference the fact that nothing in the acts detract from charter protections or, or human rights protections. So just as you said, Jim, anything that the um, governments choose to do using those emergency acts are subject to the constitution and can be challenged using the constitution. Okay, Ange, next question. Uh, yeah, the next question is from Jennifer. Uh, can the panel please address the right to peaceful assembly, such as demonstrations at Queen Par Queen's Park? People are gathering in groups greater than 10. Can people who attend be fined if they are maintaining social distance? I'm not sure the answer to that one. Um... Uh, so that's that's yeah. a great question, and it's one that... Um, you know, we're obviously concerned about at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Um, one of our staff members, in fact, took place, took part in a socially distanced protest, um, advocating for homelessness or a, a fix for the homeless situation in Toronto. Um, and part of our conversation internally was, what is the risk of um, a ticket and what would be our response if, if, this, were, if this were to come to happen? Um, more fundamentally, the did you come to a, did you come to a consensus or did you come to an answer to that question? She took the risk. Um, it was determined that the organization would fight it were that to happen, but it didn't happen. Okay. Um, but you know, at, at the core of this question is at a time when all kinds of decisions are being made for us that are controversial and that challenge, you know, our norms around rights it is deeply problematic that it's hard to gather in ways that allow us to uh, protest together if we believe that those political actions are, are wrong. So whether or not you could or couldn't be ticketed, 
I think there's a larger question about whether or not you should be allowed to be ticketed in those situations. And that's, it's not something that we're grappling with um, as a society at the moment, because we've all just been terribly obedient to the idea that we, we need to stay apart to keep everyone safe. It would be a very interesting constitutional question because our courts have been very clear that in terms of protection of freedom of expression, political discourse is the highest value. And so to use emergency measures that effectively shut down the ability to have that public discourse around such important things would be a real concern, I think, to the courts. And how that would get sorted out uh, is something that probably will be pursued sooner or later. I think one last question um, is all we have time for, Ange. Okay. Uh, yes, we have another question. What is the panel's position on the potential for the government to implement mandatory vaccination? Uh, they say that they're already seeing provincial governments initiate mandatory vaccination. I mean, is the question, do, does, does the government have a right to require it? Uh, or is it, or do we, or is it a question of, should the government have the right to, do you have a sense, Anne? Well, I kind of read exactly what they said, okay. but I'm, I'm wondering if they mean should or to comment on, I guess constitutionality around that, I would assume. I mean, my own, just again, I haven't thought a lot about this. I would just throw out there that I think any sort of mandatory vaccination scheme would likely raise issues under Section 7 of the Charter, which is life, liberty, security of the person. I think there are real autonomy issues around kind of forced medical treatment. But again, um, the question really becomes probably what it probably may be more nuanced like it is in the school situation where they say well no no one has to vaccinate their kids but then your kids can't attend public school unless you can show you know kind of your religious reason or the reason that you haven't vaccinated so to me the question is likely a little more complex which is i i i doubt they're well i don't know you know even if it's not a mandatory vaccination, does it kind of become a mandatory vaccination if you need it in order to access employment, housing, uh, education, and, and other kind of social goods? So I think there are real questions. And, and that was what I was alluding to, for example, when people say, well, maybe what we'll do is say, you know, we need to take your temperature before you enter the workplace. Well, maybe people would agree with that. But what if you had to submit to a a swab or a blood test. So I do think there are real issues around kind of autonomy in terms of your own health information and how much the government can force you to reveal that as a, as a safety measure. I'm sure CCLA has thought more about this than me even. Well, uh, I mean, this question gets into an issue that's been discussed a lot regarding anti-vaxxers, as they're called. Uh, actually, uh, there was a, a really thoughtful, long blog post written by Dax Durazio, who's a graduate student at the University of Alberta that's on the Center for Free Expression uh, website on the blog, uh, which I think if, gets into some of the complicated nuance here that we really don't have time right now to do. So if anyone's interested in that, again, our, the, uh, email, uh, sorry, the uh, website is cfe, cfe.ryerson.ca. And I'd refer the questioner or anybody else interested in that complicated question to Dax's uh, blog post. In any case, I want to take this time to thank our panelists uh, so much for agreeing to do this um, and for being part of this venture of trying to have a panel discussion uh, in this format. Uh, I'm really grateful to each of, of the four of you for, for this. Uh, and I would like to share with the audience that uh, we're having weekly uh, panel discussions. Uh, our next one is going to be a week today at the same time, Wednesday, May 13th. The subject there is the smart city in the digital world. How can issues of democratic governance, civil liberties, privacy, and surveillance be addressed? And we're going to be looking at what are the implications of these changes and the discussions of the uses of technologies in cities at large? How has that discussion changed because of the pandemic? And what are the issues that the pandemic raises for those questions we've been talking about for some other time? So if you are interested, it's the same time, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard, I mean, Eastern Daylight Time uh, next Wednesday. Um, so again, let me thank the panel so much for this and uh, thank the audience for joining in the conversation. Thanks, Jim.
Thank you, Jim. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. It was fun. Okay, Luke.